I've known Leanne for 25 years. So she has just a, an extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, personal story, I think. So if, uh, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give them a little bit of, of a blurb for the, the entertainment portion of, of today's <laughs> presentation. Um, so so Le Leanne um, grew up um, in Pittsburgh, and uh, she was the second of, of six uh, children. Uh, she excelled at sports as a child. Uh, she went to the University of uh, Connecticut on a basketball scholarship. Uh, she was class valedictorian, and she was a four-year starter on the women's basketball team. She served two years as team captain. Um, she had um, um, many um, uh, accolades during that time at, in basketball, including being twice named a GTE Academic All-American and a two-time Big East Conference Scholar Athlete of the Year. Um, she then uh, came to Hopkins, um, and uh, similar to me, I, I, I was reading that she had no idea what Hopkins was. And, um, yeah, and she said uh, in this interview that I'm, I'm taking pieces of it, or she, she was a little embarrassed that she really didn't know Hopkins was a, a powerhouse. I remember, distinctly remember telling somebody, well, I think Hopkins is kind of second rate. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, we both ended up here, and uh, she started her medical school one year before I did, and she was my big sister in the uh, medical school. And so she thought she would uh, help me by giving me her old exams to study from. Unfortunately, all that did was really intimidate me because she aced every single one of them. <laughs> um, so uh, after uh, medical school, she did uh, internship and uh, fellowship uh, in orthopedic surgery at Johns Hopkins, um, and then went on to do, uh, sorry, internship and residency in orthopedic surgery, and then went on to do her fellowship in sports medicine and shoulder surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery at Cornell University in New York City. Um, uh, she has been um, on faculty at multiple uh, institutions, including um, uh, Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. Um, and she has been a sports physician for uh, multiple uh, teams, including University of Maryland, the Terrapins, the New York Mets, USA Women's uh, Basketball, um, and USA Women's Rugby. Um, but uh, what uh, we think of her now as the uh, lead uh, team uh, physician for the Baltimore Ravens. And um, she was the first, and I still think still only, is that right? Uh, 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 and the sister, two now in sister roles. Okay, but you are the only female lead physician for the NFL. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's all really neat. Of course, her most important work is with the FSH. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, there, there are very few people across the country who really do know how to do scapular fixation well. And um, I essentially only refer uh, patients to her. And I know that uh, the FSH Society also uh, refers uh, patients uh, to her. And so we're really uh, very fortunate to have her uh, tell us what she's learned about this. So thanks for taking the time to talk. I really good to see my guests who are across the street in, uh, in school. So in terms, let me just go back uh, in terms of how I got introduced to this procedure. Uh, when I was doing my training at Hopkins, there was a pediatric orthopedist, uh, Dr. David Thompson, who I consider one of my mentors. And he, as you know, being a pediatric orthopedist, saw a lot of neuromuscular diseases. And um, he took a significant interest in individuals at FSH. And this is actually the procedure that he basically uh, came up with and technically perfected uh, and taught me. And then when he had left Hopkins uh, around 1994, he kind of passed the torch uh, to me in terms of being available to take care of our FSH patients in this area. So I maintained an active interest in this procedure for years. It's the same exact procedure that I, I learned uh, in the 1990s in my training. I'm just much more efficient at it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, orthopedics uh, is, is you know, a lot of orthopedics about quality of life and function procedures. And this procedure for the right patient will have as dramatic uh, as any impact on people's quality of life and function. So 
Uh, it will leave, uh, maybe, you know, here. I, I choose one of my uh, patients. How long ago was that? Was, uh, 18 years ago. Yeah, so um, a long time. So uh, there are plenty of patients that will, will tell you if they have this done, what a difference it makes in the quality of the function. So uh, we'll move on to talk about that. So the shoulder joint, um, it's the greatest uh, range of modes of all the joints in our body. We were, we're erect individuals, we do all things with our hands and, and shoulder, uh, overhead, so we have to be able to get our hands anywhere in space. Uh, that includes overhead. Uh, the basic anatomy of the shoulder joint, we talk about the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. I'm going to point our use of cursor here. So this is the, this is the scapula of the shoulder blade. This is your humerus. The, the, the uh, clavicle over here, the collarbone, through here. And then what we don't see on here are a lot of the muscles. We'll get to those later in the underlying ribs. But uh, the basic anatomy is that, you're, in all honesty, your, your whole arm is basically suspended from your scalp, from your clavicle. So the only articulation between, the bone to bone articulation between your, your hand uh, and your, and your uh, body comes from the AC joint and the clavicle. So this is all controlled by muscle. The, the ball and socket joint and the scalper joint is predominantly controlled by muscle function across the, um, across the area. There are 20 odd different muscles that actually work across the shoulder joint. Uh, we kind of subclassify those into muscles that work across the ball and socket joint. Uh, that would be your rotator cuff muscles and your deltoid. And there are other muscles that act across the scapula. They actually control the movement and position of your shoulder blade relative to your chest. Uh, muscles like the levator, the trapezius, the rhomboids, the serratus. Those are the, the, the movers and controllers of the scapula. To have a functionally normal shoulder, you need to have combined motion of all those muscles in both of those joints. So when you're when you're moving your arm overhead, there's a complete orchestration of all these muscles working together to achieve rotation of the arm on the socket in upper direction, as well as control rotation of your shoulder blade in upper direction. So if you watch them from behind when they raise their hand, the ball and socket joints moving upward, but so is the scapula. Um, so that's a normal, a normal individual that is a well-orchestrated, uh, consistent phenomenon. Uh, again, so this is, uh, of course, this is a video clip, I can't get it to run, but uh, the, um, so when you have your arm out to the side, you know, the scapula is in control back here, and the ball and socket muscles, the rotator cuff and delta are in control over here. So that has to be a concerted phenomenon. With FSH dystrophy, as we know, the, the scapular control gets lost in a lot of individuals. And what's happening there is for some reason we're not sure that you have that individuals have selected loss uh, of the muscle control uh, of the uh, scapular control muscles. It really predominantly early starts a lot of times in the rhomboids. Uh, you'll see it affect the trapezius. Um, we got when I operate on the individuals for these fusion type procedures. Once you get through the skin and the normal individual, you'll get right down to the muscle right there. There's a tremendous amount of musculature on your back. An individual with FSH that's really impacted, I won't encounter any muscle tissue from the skin all the way down to the shoulder blade. So there's complete uh, atrophy and fibrosis and fatty replacement of the musculature. So it just doesn't, isn't there to work. When you lose muscle control of your scapula, you can't get your arm very easily into overhead positions. And a lot of you in your will experience that. So, there's a weakness and fatigue phenomenon. Uh, commonly, these individ individuals are severely infected because you know you can't you have a very difficult time to just get into shoulder height, which eliminates your ability to do a lot of tasks overhead. It also eliminates your ability to do a lot of sustained activities with arm out in front, uh, carrying things, lifting children, and so forth. We're all impacted. Uh, the scapular wing is quite profound, as you all would know. Uh, when you're sitting, the difficulty there is that there's oftentimes this mechanical irritation of scapula on some chairs and hard, hard pieces of furniture, um, and that becomes more pronounced, and it becomes more pronounced with motion. Uh, this is some uh, photographic rep representations of that, which uh, obviously would be very familiar to this group. The principle of scapular fixation, which is orthopedic, it's a scapular thoracic fusion, we're going to fuse the scapula's underlying ribs. Like, what that's going to do is we're going to eliminate that abnormal motion from the scapula. So we're going to create basically a stable platform for the arm to move on. Because with an FSH patient with loss of scapular control, you're trying to raise the arm, the bone socket muscles work, the deltoids work in, but the scapula is going all over the place. There's no stable platform. So if we fuse the scapula to the underlying rib cage, there's now what we call a stable platform takes away the winging, and now the intact bone and socket joint can actually more easily function. So your body spends less time trying to control the scapula and more time just moving easily into these overhead positions. 
It eliminates the winging. With a successful fusion, the wing is impossible. And that leads to a lot more stamina, less fatigue, and difficulty with, with daily activity. I just have a, unfortunately, I had a lot more pay, uh, slides one point time, but as technology does, we lose a hard drive, we lose all your data. But uh, this gentleman here actually is currently in the hospital now, about to go discharge him uh, uh, this afternoon. But uh, I had done, he is uh, he's in his 20s, he actually uh, is a landscaper. And uh, his right side was done by me about a year ago. And this is the left side, which I've done earlier this week. You can see the dramatic difference just in the standing posture of his shoulder. This is a more, if you ignore the scar, this is a more normal shoulder posture. This is simply standing, the shoulder droops down, and there's no scapular control. He's got this baseline winging of the scapula here. If he does simple elevation, this arm relatively easily comes forward, and you see the profound winging of his, uh, of his arm. So um, that's the difference that you'll see with a stable platform shoulder versus unstable platform shoulder, so fused versus unfused uh, shoulder. Flip it sideways, but uh, here we go. So, sorry, about, I don't know why I did that, but uh, you can kind of see how this video is going to continually loop. But it, with a fused right shoulder, okay, go back and see if we'll start again. Try again, I'll start to see if we'll flip it. So, fused right shoulder, it easily gets his hand overhead. Uh, with the unstable left one, it really struggles, even gets a trunk lean to try to get the arm barely to 90. It's a dramatic difference. So uh, I infused his one shoulder. He, uh, he did well with that. He worked all summer uh, with his landscaping business, and he started on his own. And uh, he came in to get the other infused over the winter months to be ready for the spring. So he's, um, he's a relatively representative example of what you should expect with the properly chosen patient. So who are surgical candidates? Well, obviously, uh, leave you relatively healthy without any additional medical concerns would make you high risk for surgery. Uh, poor shoulder function with a desire to be better. Some people perfectly adapt to the loss of function and have no interest in going into procedures for that. Uh, the involvement has been limited to the scapula muscle. This is the key selection criteria for an FSH patient. Um, well, in a lot of patients, the disease process is limited to the scapula muscles. There are those who have uh, effect on the deltoid and the rotator cuff. So if you have involvement of both groups of muscles, you're not going to really see the benefit from a scapular fusion. So even if, we, if you don't have enough deltoid control or, or cuff control along the socket joint, you won't achieve any improvement in movement. So uh, it's really about proper patient selection as it is with a lot of surgeries in general. How do we determine that in the office? Well, there's a bunch of steps we'll go through to assess is the rotator cuff working, is the deltoid working. Uh, there's a maneuver called a manual compression test where I'll stand behind the patient. I'll really physically try to control the scapula with my hand, mimic the fusion, and we'll see if we can see what kind of elevation that will demonstrate. Uh, that is a, a helpful test, uh, but there are some other maneuvers we'll do an exam simply to assess is the rotator cuff functioning or not. Um, Patient obviously has to have a desire or willingness to undergo the procedure and comply with the post-operative restrictions, which are relatively cumbersome. When we will talk to you about that. So it's a relatively long process from surgery to full release. I've become a little bit more uh, generous with my time frames compared to before uh, coming to trust what we do and, and anticipating when the fusion occurs. So it's probably not as restrictive as it may have been 18 years ago, but it's still quite burdensome nonetheless. I'll walk you through this procedure. The procedure itself is it's done under general anesthesia. People are intubated on the belly or fully asleep. Right? We roll you, uh, the patient face down, his body on the back, and obviously individuals are fully monitored. We'll make an incision along the board of the scapula, much like you saw the gentleman's uh, picture from earlier earlier this week. And we simply just go down, and we, we have to get down to the, so we're working with volunteers. You basically dissect your clear away. Uh, the soft tissues and an FSH patient, a lot of those soft tissues really are abnormal. The, the muscle tissues become really more fibrous tissue. We get a complete uh, exposure of the inner margin of the scapula there uh, and the underlying rib levels. Now, how many ribs do we fuse? It really depends. I, I've been now shying away to get, I think I can confidently get a fusion in the majority of individuals by just fusing the three ribs. It's less surgical dissection, it's less bleeding. And in the event that there may be any potential pulmonary issues, I think it will minimize that and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, and then in, in my hands, I use the wiring technique, which I'll show you the x-ray on it, 
Uh, there are multiple other reports in the literature about how people do this. Some use wires, some use plates and screws, some use just plates. Uh, I've used a simple wiring technique. It's very simple to do. It's very well tolerated. Uh, and it's relatively straightforward. Uh, we do need bone graft, right? So when we put the scapula uh, onto the my ribs, we want to put a lot of extra bone around there to facilitate bone to bone growth together of the scapular ribs. We, we pack in there additional sources of bone. Uh, the most reliable source of bone for fusions in this area as well as anywhere in the body is bone from your own body. So we take um, the technique I use, I use bone from the back of the hip. Uh, typically if I'm doing the left shoulder, I use the right hip and vice versa. It kind of uh, just shares the discomfort uh, posteriorly there. Uh, there are some off-the-shelf bone graft products that you can avoid the hip incision, but uh, statistically they're not necessarily as, as predictable. So I usually still rely on, on the patient's own hip for the source of that. You can use, uh, there are some on-market uh, implantable bone stimulators. I went through a phase where I was using those, but they're relatively expensive, and I don't know that they're really necessary. So if I have, a, have a, any concern about anything, uh, I might consider it, but I've really gone away from that. But you know, schematically, this is what we're looking at. Um, we, we make the surgical incision, and we, we clean away the soft tissues, the muscle, and the scar, and so forth in a very meticulous fashion to really get down to the, to the working margin of the inner aspect of the ribs. The muscles that you're showing here are the rotator cuff. These muscles will be normal, and we want to preserve those, because those will give you your movement power. So we're only reflecting the small margin of those when we operate. And then, and then you get closer to the scapula, and in different patterns of wiring. I use the finger bay technique, so, and again, as I talk, this, this demonstrates fusion here to five rib levels. I've recently been restricting it to three. Uh, maybe four, but never really five anymore. Because uh, once you when, when you when you breathe, your ribs have to move. Right? They separate. So if you fuse those ribs to the scapula, you limit those movement, and you do worry that there may be some pulmonary issues. Now, there's only been one case report in the literature about someone really losing critical pulmonary function after fusion. I've not had it. I had one patient that had pulmonary issues post-op, but uh, we, we came to figure out that she probably had a mild form of asthma before the procedure we didn't know about, so that was a new diagnosis post-op.